to this uh, first EU votes Thursday panel uh, kind of related to the election in November. Uh, my name is Xiaoyun Yang, I teach me Asian history in the Department of History, and I was born and raised in a little Southeast Asian city state called Singapore. So let's, let's start from the, this table there, and uh, each of our panelists will just introduce themselves. Um, my name is Edith Kutler. I teach a woman and gentleman in international studies. Hi. My name is Edith Kutler. Can you hear? It's not on, I think. Can you hear? You, 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 you. There you go. Yeah. Uh, my name is Edith Kutler. I teach a woman and gender studies and international studies at Denison, and I do research with the refugees in the country. Uh, my name is Pedro Galenas. I don't know if that is too loud. It's okay. Uh, I teach uh, economics here at Denison, and I was uh, born and raised in Venezuela. Hi, my, my name is Christine Pei, teaching in religion department and women's and gender studies. My academic research is about uh, religious ethics of peace and war and American military bases in East Asia. I was born and raised in South Korea, and yeah, that's it. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Catherine Stewart. I'm uh, in the Art History and Visual Culture Department. I focus on East Asia. I teach about East Asia. Um, I was born in Japan, raised in Belgium, a small European country. All right, thanks, everyone. So, uh, yeah, the, the reason for um, this panel uh, really is this, that, uh, you know, there's a lot of talk in the media about what the stake in this election is coming in November, uh, but, uh, you know, the, the Democrats have their uh, kind of stance on what the stake, the Republicans have their stance on what the stake, um, and the people who are neither have their, have their stake as well. But a lot of it really tends to be concerned only with domestic issues. Right? I think you know what these are. Um, and uh, it's easy to forget, uh, in the midst of all that, that a lot is at stake for the world as well, right? And we as international bank, we don't have the luxury of forgetting that because we come from somewhere else and we still care about the places that we came from, okay? And we would like for you to know what we care about and maybe care about those things as well. So uh, let's kind of cut to the chase here. Um, the first question really is a big one, just you know, from an international perspective, right? Especially the perspective of your country, your nation, your world region, right? Uh, what do you think is at stake in this coming election? So let's, uh, let's anyone who wants to go first, go ahead. I want to so, uh, briefly talk about two things. As you know, we are dealing with COVID-19 as a global community. And perhaps you know that since the COVID-19 hit the entire world, and anti-Asian violence has been tripled. So the anti-Asian hatred and violence in the United States has been always tied with US-Asia relations. So if the United States has good relationship with Asian countries, especially China, 
that anti-Asian violence kind of diminishes. But then if there is an escalated tension between the United States and East Asian countries, then hate crimes that target East Asians has always increased. Since the COVID-19, uh, during this COVID-19 pandemic, anti-Asian violence, both physical, verbal, and psychological, has been people that really scares me living in this country. And second is excessive militarization of the world led by the United States and also China and Russia is really, um, scare it really scaring me and alarming me in many ways because the military bases are number one polluter in the world and it really kills people and kills our future. Can I just build on that? Uh, coming from Belgium, which is the seat of the administration for the European Union, I just want to highlight the many international organizations out of which uh, this administration has, uh, from which this administration has withdrawn. So not just organizations, but also accords and agreements. And I'll just list, I think I have 10 here and I might not be filling them out all. So please let the next uh, panelists uh, supplement that or, or, or correct where I was mistaken. So the Paris Climate Accord, this is maybe the, the single global issue that is the most pressing and for the, for the whole world. Uh, and uh, not participating is, is, is really not an option if you, are, if you care for future generations um, and, and the rest of the life of this generation. So the, the Iran nuclear deal, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, uh, with that, um, a renegotiation of NAFTA as well as CORA, so the Korean-US, trade agreement uh, uh, in the World Trade Organization blocking the appointment of judges that could then uh, 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 seat on the appeals board. So there's very little work now possible in the WTO in terms of um, um, intervening in local, uh, in local uh, disagreements, right? So managing disagreements in trade across the globe. The World Health Organization connects to what, to what Dr. Pei was saying, really key. It started in July 20 and it will be effective next year, 21 in July, on July the 6th. Uh, for UNESCO, uh, um, retreated in, at the end of 2019, the UN Human Rights Council, the UN Relief and Works Agency, which gives support to uh, Palestinian refugees, NATO, and I think that that's the end of my list. Well, NATO, not quite yet, but uh, you know. it, it's coming up. It's, coming coming up. Up. it's annou announced in 18. Okay. Uh, let's go to this table. Okay. All right. Um, so, actually, I don't know what I was on my list. Um, I, I am Palestinian. I grew up in Israel. I've been living in the United States. So I have connections to all of these spaces and the politics of all of these spaces. So the fact that the uh, uh, Trump administration uh, pulled out funding to UNRWA, UNRWA is a, a UN uh, 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 agency that works with Palestinian refugees. Palestinian refugees, until recently, were the largest refugee community in the world, and they are a product of the wars that we faced, particularly the displacement in 1948. Uh, after we've seen their uh, Afghans became also a large, uh, one of the largest in the world, and then Iraqis and now Syrians. So you can tell what region has uh, been producing. And for me, that's really interesting because I was checking some numbers before I came today uh, to find out that actually uh, $25.5 billion uh, worth of weapons have been sold in 2019 to nine Middle Eastern countries by the United States in comparison to 11.8 in 2018, so that's 118% increase. And we think when we take the, the weapons sold, what countries, what regimes, but we also have to look at the consequences, right? What's happening on the ground, because we have now started with revolutions in 2011, some evolved into uh, uh, civil wars, so we have the region more or less on fire. And it's really interesting to think of the weapons, the refugees, the displacement, the consequences. So that's something I wanted to put on the table. The Iran nuclear deal was another um, uh, the piece of 
course, um, uh, with um, the piece because it's very much with uh, big quotation marks for the uh, agreement that have been signed uh, uh, recently between Israel and the United Arab Emirates and with Bahrain are uh, interesting to put within a larger context of the uh, deal of the century, right? That the Trump administration tried to push and to push really hard. Uh, and they tried to push it um, uh, by kind of um, not addressing the needs of Palestinians in that because for any agreement that this is why it didn't um, get momentum in the region and now we see these side agreements with uh, both, uh, between Israel and Bahrain and, and the Emirates and they're saying it is kind of to, um, to prevent uh, uh, deterioration in relations, etc. But I see it more as um, um, serving two purposes. One, it's a neoliberal because there are economic interests and that would be Iran because that's really interesting. But the marginalization through um, uh, preventing the funds from going to UNRWA, which supports Palestinian refugees, not just in the occupied Palestinian territories and West Bank and Gaza, but also in the diaspora, particularly in the camps in Lebanon uh, with the Syrian refugees or Palestinians who are in Syria and now refugees. So it's really interesting to think of the impact, but also think of this um, as a larger. So I think of the Middle East as kind of microcosm to some of the foreign policy issues. And when it comes to the Middle East, whether it's Democrats or Republicans, it doesn't always make a huge difference. But it's interesting with these, with the withdrawal from, from these, I'm pushing the deal of the century. There was more of a what they see as stripping more, it's like more blunt, the US's policy, and also more uh, forceful. Uh, and the Trump administration wanted a deal, they didn't get it to the Palestinians, so now they're going to be tried here. But what hurts me the most, and I'll end here, is this um, uh, umbrella kind of um, um, where right wing parties in Europe are increasing in power in other places in the world. So, what is this giving? Because when you I lived the last few years of the U.S. and when you think of how much people follow what's happening in this country. So what happens in this country has an impact, direct or indirect, and what this is giving kind of recover for lots of people to come and uh, maintain right-wing policies, policies of exclusion, when it comes to immigrants, to refugees, when you cut funds, when you prevent people from coming to this country. This really gives cover to others to maintain certain policies, and if the U.S. is doing it, then they can do it as well. So I want us to do that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, let's go to the couple of Canadians. Well, if I may, um, I won't talk about these very important issues and foreign policy. I will try, instead of providing you uh, my perspective, as a Venezuelan, uh, in the following sense, uh, as you know, Venezuela is, is no longer a democracy. And I was, uh, when I was born there, we had a, a democracy, and it was looked from many different countries of Latin American region as one of the most solid democracies around. And I saw how democracy deteriorated and ultimately ended. And uh, I think that the relevance of that story to what is currently going on in the US is that I see many parallels with what I experienced when, we, when, we, when this was taking place. Uh, the uh, template that I see has been followed by the Trump administration is very close to the template that was implemented by Chavez. Uh, who started all this process of deterioration of democracy. And uh, one of the things that worries me a lot is seeing, is telling to myself, oh, I've seen this movie before. And uh, one of those things has to do with the, the polarization that we are now uh, experiencing, not only uh, here in the US, but I would say all over the world. And, uh, but now seeing it in the US, it's, uh, uh, little bit scary to me. Um, uh, I, there is an interesting uh, article uh, in The Guardian where they uh, compare Chavez to Donald Trump. And I will uh, just uh, mention that reference. So if you want to just Google that and read a little bit about that, so you'll have a, a better sense of what I'm trying to say, because I think 
time is limited and I don't want we, I can spend hours here talking about that. <laughs> All right. Thanks. Uh, so the, let me just share my answer to the question before we go to the next one. Now, uh, from my point of view as a Singaporean, uh, you know, what's at stake in this election and in how American politics progresses over the next uh, you know, four or eight years uh, really is, is nothing less than the sovereignty, the security, and the survival of a state like Singapore. Um, you know, for all its flaws and imperfections, the liberal international order that the U.S. has upheld since the end of the Second World War uh, has been the only guarantee of Singapore's existence as an independent state since it came into existence in 1965. Um, now, if, as seems to be the case right now, the U.S. is losing its sense of commitment to that order uh, and is withdrawing from its responsibilities to it, uh, what we are going to see in Asia is a reversion to the law of the jungle, a world of empires. And uh, in that kind of a world, Singapore cannot survive. It is too small, it is too vulnerable, it cannot stand up to bigger countries than itself, especially a country as big as China. Uh, all right, let's, let's get to uh, question two, um, which could be kind of interesting to, to some of you because you may not have heard very much about this. But the question is this, how is the US perceived differently, if at all, across the globe, and especially in your part of the world, now than it was four years ago? What has changed? And now I speak as one South Korean person. So to say that I need to just give you a brief, uh, the, the, the briefly some like contextual and historical background of the Korean Peninsula. Many people know that Korean Peninsula is divided into North and South, and people don't know why. The country was divided because of superpowers such as the United States, former Soviet Union, China, the uh, UK and France. So Korea was colonized by Japan from 1945. When World War was over, as you know, Germany was divided into East and West. So that Japan was supposed to be divided into, I don't know, North Japan or South Japan, but instead of dividing Japan, they divided the superpower countries divided the Korean Peninsula into North and South. So North, 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 North Korea was aligned with the former Soviet Union, so it became a communist country. And then South Korea was aligned with the United States because North was occupied by former, former Soviet Union for three years, uh, for two years, and then the southern part of South Korea, the southern part of Korean Peninsula was had been occupied by US military for three years. So that's how the Korea was divided into North and South. Then the war between North and South Korea broke out back in 1950, but that was a, like a full-scale global war, actually, because like about 36 countries were directly and indirectly involved in this war. And obviously, the United Nations was the leading army um, among these UN allied armies fighting for South Korea. Then, can you imagine this war has never ended? So the, technically, the Korean War has been going on in Peninsula for the seven, for the last seventy years, because the the, the treaty the the, tri the truce treaty was signed between uh, the UN represented by the United States and North Korea China allies. That this treaty never ended the war. It was just they take they there, but the treaty was about let's take a break from war. And then we are taking 70 war break. It's a 70 year break. So most recently, the president of South Korea asked the UN, UN to sign the peace treaties between the between North and South Korea so that the war they can actually uh, be ended. But then the United States is not interested in that. So let's say four years ago, I came to the United States during when, when Clinton was the president. At that time, Korea was divided, still divided. And then the Clinton administration was about to mobilize US, military, US soldiers in South Korea to attack North Korea. And then the South Korean government, Kim Dae-jung, intervened at that time so the war didn't break out. And then 20 years ago, when I started graduate school here, a September 11 terrorist attack happened um, in 2001, that I was really scared because North Korea was uh, named as one axis of evil by George W. Bush. 
I was scared because people don't Americans don't know whether we are in South Korea or North Korea. They don't care actually. So it was a kind of thing. And then during Obama administration, the Obama administration actually imposed more stricter uh, embargo and sanction on North Korea. So the, US, the North Korea US relations was pretty bad. However, the US South Korean relations was much better than now because uh, the US and South Korea were considered each other as partners in the problem of the peninsula, in the East Asian problem. And now the Trump administration actually forces the South Korean government to pay more for the US military bases in South Korea. And then they, they repeat this claim like South Korean soldiers sacrificed themselves to defend South Koreans from North Korea. This kind of rhetoric has been ongoing for 70 years. So the Trump administration's rhetoric, um, I'm not saying like the, the situation in, in South Korea has been, um, ha has dramatically changed uh, for the last 70 years. The country has been divided still and they are still dealing with the complicated relationship among uh, South Korea, North Korea and the United States. But I say like at least four years ago, many South Koreans perceived the United States as a, some kind of a strategic partner, a conversation partner. But then now in the Trump administration, um, even though the President Trump visited North Korea, it was like a show. Nothing happened after his visit to North Korea. Then now the North Korea, uh, the United States, kind of implement, implemented the unilateral, unilateral relationship uh, toward South Korea. So a lot of South Koreans are um, complaining about the U.S. administration's kind of attitude towards toward South Korea, such as the United States is a kind of contest. May, may I ask uh, you a follow-up question uh, based on two things that uh, have, come, have kind of come out from books that are published recently, Bob Woodward's book and also John Bolton's book. Now, on the one hand, uh, Trump claims that he has a great friendship with Kim Jong-un, that Kim Jong-un admires him tremendously, uh, and that because of that, because of the fact Kim Jong-un loves him so much, North Korea will not make trouble. And in fact, you can just give North Korea a free hand because um, he's a friend of Trump. Um, on the other hand, according to John Bolton's book, uh, Trump has, uh, has said in the past, you know, we're paying $10 billion a year to keep South Korea in existence and they're not doing their part. Why are we such losers and suckers to be keeping them alive when North Korea is our friend? Now, what do South Koreans think about statements like that? My answer is kind of complicated, so I'm trying to just simplify the question. I just sim the sim like, I try to uh, simplify my answer. As I said, um, Kim Jong-un may be Donald Trump's, President Trump's friend, but again, friendship, they should bring some fruition, let's say peace or ending of the Korean War, but nothing actually happened. He visited and then he got a lot of, the President Trump visited, North, met, so he visited Singapore <laughs> to meet Kim Jong-un and then got a lot of global attention but then nothing has followed since then. I would say the North Korean US relations had deteriorated since then. I don't think President Trump knows that. <laughs> okay, I, I guess I know at least. Um, and then right now, the current conversation between South Korea and the US, uh, United States is the Trump administration, as I said, like forces the um, South Korean government pay more to maintain the U.S. military bases in South Korea. And then the Korean, South Koreans are divided over the presence of U.S. military because um, U.S. military has posed a lot of problems inside, the Korea, inside the South Korea. So then still like a lot of South Koreans are puzzled. Why do we still need to host this foreign army in the heart of the country? And yet people also agree that perhaps we still need the presence of the U.S. military. 
However, South Korean just think that we have paid enough for the existence of U.S. military. So many people feel that it's unjust um, to it's un, it's unjust for the U.S. government to use South Korea and use U.S. military in South Korea as a leverage to get more public attention to the Trump administration. Thank you. Um, can we move to Dr. Stewart? Um, how has the perception of the U.S. and the EU uh, yeah. changed in the last four years? Thank you, uh, Shine. It's, it's, a, it's a big question. And actually, I had no numbers, so I quickly Googled. And uh, last week, the Pew Research Center note that most of my source of information are actually U.S. publications and U.S. Uh, newspapers, magazines, and, and, and scholarly publications. So the, the power of the, and, and the ingenuity and the endurance of journalism and research in the U.S. is, is really admirable. Um, so here, Pew Research Center, Belgium is the very lowest at 24% of um, positive favorable uh, views of the U.S. Uh, a, a, a poll that was done last week and a 9% confidence in Trump. But it is just part of an overall trend, uh, a huge dip that goes back apparently to the levels that we saw during the um, the the the, uh, the the war on Iraq, right? So 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 these, you know, the the yeah, in the it's, there's a very clear and direct connection between the kinds of international policies, and in this case, the the many forms of the withdrawal of all these. Uh, you know, international in entities that are uh, essential to the, to let's say the the, the governing of, of of the global, not just economy but also uh, politics, um, and, and the global world, and this and, and these opinions, I guess. Yeah. So, uh, if I could just follow up, uh, you know, one of the kind of key characteristics or themes of the Trump administration has been its uh, unwillingness to pursue any kind of confrontation with Russia. Now, how is that perceived in the EU? Is that perceived sympathetically or does that cause some kind of concern? Well, I think if you listen to uh, certain statements made by EU leaders recently, of course, this is a, this is a matter of great concern, right? And, and the situation of Belarus now, and the situation of the Ukraine uh, before that, um, you know, continues to be a, a, a site of, you know, of stress and 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 uh, and uh, longer longer term uh, potential uh, enduring crises. Right? Of course, these are very very complex situations that, uh, you know, locally, yeah, that deserve more attention. But yeah, of course, of course, right? this is this is a this is a big concern. Uh, can we go to documents here? Yes, I actually, can you hear me? Yeah, a little bit closer. Is this better? Yeah. Okay, I want to build up on uh, the point that Dr. Snor had mentioned. Um, it's actually interesting when we think about um, these superpowers and how the geopolitics uh, and global politics are manifesting themselves in the Middle East when we think about the Russians, <laughs> the Americans, um, when we think about Turkey, when we think about Iran. Uh, we have a lot to say about confrontation, right, and control of territories, what's happen happening in Syria, where the Russians are uh, with the regime of opposite Assad, and then the areas with the Kurds, there's uh, uh, some are uh, standing, uh, the Americans provide weapons, and then Turkey wants a peace, and then uh, Iran wants another peace. So you see, the whole region is like we're back to 1916, where it was divided by colonial powers. Every country is kind of being taken by these different powers. Um, and definitely the United States, like I said in, in earlier remarks about the selling of weapons, and it's not just the United States, also France and um, uh, England and Germany are one of the um, highest uh, producers and, and sellers of weapons. To, uh, and of course, Russia and China, depending on who's, <laughs> who's aligning with whom and who's selling to them. So that's one point I want to just keep there for us to think about in terms of how um, uh, the U.S. is um, is part of these uh, interests and plays a major role, especially that the United States went into Iraq. And actually, there are analysts, and I um, would like to put this point uh, for us to think about out there, that actually argue that with the uh, occupation of Iraq, the U.S. invasion of Iraq in 2000, um, 
and free. Um, we started seeing the carpet being pulled from under um, the Middle East as the region more generally. So it's really interesting when we think about the system that was introduced for uh, lack of transparency, democracy, accountability. You go in, you depose the regime, you uh, dismantle the, uh, the military, um, human rights abuses, uh, uh, massive uh, uh, waves of refugees, although people didn't leave immediately after 2003, it took them until 2006, 7, and 8 to start leaving in the Libyan of Iraq. We started seeing kind of the start of what, if you want to call it, the unraveling of the Middle East, or what we see in front of our eyes. But like I said, I've been living outside the United States for the last two years. And it's really interesting um, to see how people perceive the U.S. because for people on the outside, it's hard for them to understand how polarized this country is and how much difference there is and that it's like a, a slight chance and it could be Biden or, or the difference isn't much. But I think people from the outside are having a hard time just for the, from the ones I talked to and I spent days, time in different places in the Middle East and in Europe and they say, um, What's happening in the United States? I mean, we hear these questions. Uh, I was there uh, when COVID started, uh, in terms of the time, the number of deaths, uh, position on immigration, uh, laws that are being eroded. In regards to Americans, and people are asking why? How is this like being allowed to happen? And what? where would this end? And yesterday, hearing President Trump talking about recession if he loses the elections. And you think you're hearing uh, uh, the president in, I don't know. I mean, not that I am not for U.S. exceptionalism, etc., but people do look up to the U.S. as a holder of, of democracy and rights. Although, with with Iraq and with Vietnam and with million wars in Korea, and, uh, uh, we actually see how the system is uh, eroding, and it will be interesting to see what will happen now with the court nomination and the Republican elections. I myself am very worried about what will happen in November. Uh, and post November 3rd, more than uh, November, uh, the election itself is the day after. Uh, and also, thank you. Dr. Lucero, if I could ask you a follow up question. Uh, President Trump is uh, kind of touting the normalization of relations between Israel and Bahrain and the UAE uh, as his greatest achievement in the Middle East. Now, at the same time, people looking at what's going on are, are drawing the conclusion of kind of kind of being the concern that the Palestinian cause is essentially being abandoned by the Arab world. Um, so how do you perceive what's going on there? I mean, it's interesting. This is not new. If you look at the, many of the regimes in the region, they are not necessarily democratic ones, and the Palestinian form is president. If you have a liber liberation movement, this liberation movement forms a threat to a regime that wants to sustain its rule uh, by, by force. So it was interesting to see, although they funded uh, the Palestinian organization, but in, in many other parts, they also worked against the, uh, um, the Palestinian cause. What's happening now, um, like I said earlier, I see it very much. Trump wants to have a deal with the Middle East, and it's more an economic and political deal that brings him also uh, benefits in regard to the election. And it's with twisting arms. He couldn't twist, twist the arms of the Palestinians. I mean, their position is weaker, but it was weaker before even Trump came into power. It was weakened by the signing of the Oslo Agreement that we're supposed to have this gradual kind of will give you rights slowly, slowly. But instead of rights, more settlements were being built and more power as occupation was entrenched. So we see it starting from 93, actually, not just now. For me, what's happening with the, uh, with the deal of the century, it was the economic uh, benefits that he thought would be tempting for the Palestinians. But the Palestinians, like with Arafat, when Clinton tried to push him, they can't cross when it comes to Jerusalem, when it comes to refugees. I mean, these are red lines that I mean, nothing is left of the Palestinian cause if we cross these lines. So I think for a position now, it's maybe clarifying more where the Gulf countries are in relation to um, to the Palestinian cause, but also the region itself, because it's under attack. If you look at what's happening, happening in Yemen, in Libya, in Syria, what's happening in Iraq, I mean, the liberation of Iraq is a facade, right? To corrupt regime, has deals, um, the US is invested economically in that space. Um, you didn't bring democracy necessarily, huge numbers of refugees in the million. Uh, but the situation now in Lebanon with the, uh, with the explosion, uh, with COVID, I mean, all of these are making people's lives really miserable and tough. And then we talk about a deal where it's like this 
Lesbian and I's military superheroes coming to raise the Middle East. I don't think anybody is buying into that. So it's interesting also to see, because in Israel itself there are demonstrations against Netanyahu saying now you're making deals with the outside, with these two countries, instead of addressing the, the problems that we have in the country itself in regard to holding elections three times in the year, COVID, uh, and all kinds of other things. Thank you. Uh, let's go to Dr. Cadenas to hear about uh, Latin America and Venezuela. Yeah, so, uh, well, in terms of Venezuela, now that I sort of said what I thought was more important, although I didn't talk much about it, and there are certain uh, things that should have been said, but now that I, I said that, I have said that, in terms of geopolitical uh, issues of the United States and Venezuela, I think that the main concerns have to do with, with the close relationships that the government is now having with Russia. Uh, the fact that uh, drug trafficking in Venezuela is a huge node uh, in, the, in the region. And uh, terrorism seems to have grown under the auspices of the current government. So I think there are many reasons uh, of concern for the United States about what is going on uh, in Venezuela. And uh, the, I think the attitude of people from Venezuela about uh, the Trump administration, for example, uh, looks kind of ambivalent because on the one hand, they feel the need of intervention because they don't think that, we don't think that if we can get rid of the dictatorship by just having public protests, uh, because we have been doing that for many, many years. Um, uh, on the other hand, uh, there is a great deal of anxiety because, as I said, uh, many Venezuelans believe, as I do, that, oh my God, we have seen this movie before. There are many common uh, behaviors that we're seeing uh, now here that we have seen uh, in the past. And uh, if uh, later uh, you want me to talk a little bit more specifically about what those uh, signs are, I'll be happy to comment on that. All right, so let's move on to another question. Uh, and that, this might be our last question uh, based on how the time is going. Um, so the question is this, uh, how do you think US foreign policy will shift depending on who is elected? Um, especially with regard to the region that you're from. Now, we can think of this in terms of hopes and fears. What is your biggest hope in terms of how foreign policy might change depending on the election outcome? What's your biggest fear of how it might change in government's best case scenario, worst case scenario? Uh, now, let me just start by saying something about, uh, about Singapore. Now, uh, in Singapore, we basically have two existential fears that are always with us. Uh, the first is being forced to choose between the US and China. Um, and why is that scary? Because we're afraid that if we, are, if we are forced to choose the US, the US will sell us out. And we're afraid that if we are forced to choose China, China will eat us up. Neither is a great uh, thing to happen to a place like Singapore. But on the other hand, there's a bigger fear than being forced to choose. And increasingly, we are being forced to choose by both sides because we've always tried to be friends with everybody in the region and maintain good, good relations with everybody because that's in our best interest. But increasingly that's becoming unviable as the US and China become uh, more and more hostile to each other. Um, but the bigger fear than that is one of not even having a choice at all. Not just being forced to choose, but not having a choice. If the US decides unilaterally to just leave Southeast Asia, just like the British did in, back in 1965 in Singapore, became independent and we had to basically fend for ourselves, but fortunately we had the US at our back. Um, if this time the US leaves and there's no one to pick things up, except for China, then I doubt that we can remain independent for long. That's our biggest fears. That's what keeps us up at night. Um, and there's very little that we can do about it because we're small, except try to be friends with everyone else as long as it's possible. Uh, but okay, let me uh, move on to hearing from other parts of the world. Uh, let's uh, go the usual sequence, starting with this table. So hopes and fears, best case scenario, worst case scenario for 
um, Dr. Green? All right, I, I see it. I kept to see things very complicatedly. So if my um, hopes and fears are everywhere, please understand. Um, I cannot represent the entire South Korean's hope and fear, but many of many friends of mine and I wonder whether the reunification of two Koreas will be possible in the near future because the division between North and South Korea has caused a lot of problems and often this division justified um, state-sanctioned violence against like LGBTQI movements, feminist movements, and any sort of like social justice movements have been easily oppressed for the sake of the security of South Korea. And then the United States is not blameless for that. And then I'm also worried about, I'm also, I, but, so I hope that the United States in the near future will sign for the peace treaties between North Korea and the United States and also between North and South Korea. And I also hope that the US-China relations will be better uh, South Korea lives in a different context compared to Singaporeans. Uh, South Korea has been a kind of battlefield between China and the United States. Whenever the tension between China and the United States has been escalated, and South Korea has to choose between China and the United States, and then the choice always came with whenever, whatever side they choose, always there was a huge price tag. And then the United States can easily use South, the land of South Korea as its strategic like, military basis. So whenever they put um, the conspiracy going on as I'm talking about it, I'm talking about <laughs> so it's, it's, and then the US-China relations uh, concerned me Asian American communities, as I said earlier, always uh, the, the social status of Asian Americans depend on the US East Asian countries' relations. So I hope that the United States, whoever, I, okay, I'm not saying too much. <laughs> I hope that the, in the future, United States consider itself as a global partner. I wish the United States can put global partnership over U.S. exceptionalism. Perhaps U.S. exceptionalism worked during the Cold War period, but then now the entire global community is dealing with the COVID-19, climate change, and war, and all kinds of problems. The U.S. alone cannot solve this problem. And we hope the United States does not cause more problems, but consider more, uh, consider global partnership more rather than choosing isolationism that the current government seems to choose. Thank you. Just a quick question, a quick answer. So speaking from Europe, just a, a, a talk that Angela Merkel, the Chancellor of Germany gave just a few days ago, and you can find it on Twitter. Uh, she spoke very eloquently about the fact that the peace that has existed in Europe since uh, the Second World War is actually historically a relatively rare occurrence and that uh, it is very easy for us to pivot back uh, if the tensions that have built up in the last few years continue uh, on course. So uh, th that danger is real. Uh, I remember from my own grandfather who fought not just in the first, he fought in the First World War, he volunteered as a very young 18 year old and um, and he lived through the Second World War, uh, active as a house father, but also in, in part, of, part of some resistance. And so what he said after those wars is that once people forget that uh, this will happen again, uh, the, you know, the, 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 the ability to imagine or to, to remain, remain alert to the built up towards the kind of uh, tensions and socially as well as inter, inter, interstate tensions geopolitical tensions that lead to war, 
when they fade from our sort of consciousness, that, that becomes really risky. And I think that's what uh, Dr. Cadenas is saying. He, he recognizes this. This is, some, this is a lived experience. And it's very important to listen to these kinds of messages. But apart from speaking from the position of a EU, EU citizen, really as a world citizen, the first and foremost concern is that we do not get on track as a globe, as a, as a world community to fight against climate change and to do what we need to do in order to avert the, uh, the, you know, the consequences that are already taking place. Let me just add that, uh, you know, for Singapore, climate change is not something you can ignore. Uh, it's a small island, the sea is rising. We know that it could basically just destroy us uh, if things go continue the way they are. Um, I mean, for the next two decades, the sea is going to rise uh, in Singapore at least by one meter. Um, and we are building sea walls and taking measures. But really, you know, the whole globe has to get its act together. And right now, uh, the US is the biggest obstacle to it. Um, let's go to this table here. I want to emphasize the, um, the connection because what we see with COVID, with the climate uh, change, um, we are connected. Even if we want to consider the US the world in its own, we're connected to the rest of the world. We really, with these issues, we can't isolate and say the line stops here. So it's important to think of the connection. Um, I actually think we're living through the worst. I can't even fathom another worse than like if i look at the middle east i work with refugees it's one of the worst periods ever really it's like everything is happening the war the displacement the water shortages the weapons the uh, uh, pollution the uh, uh, disease that around people want freedom they went out to the streets put their lives on, on, on you know out there and they're back with even worse regimes as was the case in egypt so this is something to really worry about but for me also as someone who teaches women's studies who really concerned about this kind of idea of this very masculinized, arrogant culture that is being promoted and, and it's considered now natural and kind of the way to go. That worries me deeply because what kind of model are we setting for the younger generation? So there are like different levels for thinking about this. And, and I think, you know, we're all watching what will happen uh, um, before, during and after. So it's a kind of continuum. Um, that is, uh, we're all involved in, and we should attack every way we can. Is that the worst? That would be question. What's the best thing that could happen? What's the worst thing that could happen? Well, I, I would just kind of like throw something out there that Dr. Kennedy already knows uh, from me, which is that uh, uh, President Trump has in the past contemplated invading Venezuela to get the oil. And he said, according to John Dalton, that it would be really cool if America could do that. Um, he has not done that yet, because I think there are some kind of wiser heads uh, in the administration still. Right? But yeah, who knows? But you know, that may not be the worst case scenario uh, to your mind. So I'll let you. Yeah, I think it would be easy for me to build on the last question. You know, asking an economist about the best and the worst is very, is a difficult question. We think in terms of trade-off. I think the best scenario has some good and bad things, at least in terms of what I conceive to be the best and some things to be worst. But I think it's easier the other question uh, about the invasion that has been said. And uh, I think that when I said that the Venezuelans have an ambivalent attitude towards the Trump administration, it's precisely because of that. They, they have been seeing that the Trump administration have been imposing several sanctions on key uh, leaders of the uh, Venezuelan government. And that has had some uh, positive effects. And because they feel desperate, that the only way in which they can get rid of what's going on is through intervention, I think they look at that possibility with sympathy. Uh, on the other hand, as I said, uh, we are deeply uh, worried because of the similarities that we are seeing between what we see in the Trump administration and what we have experienced in the past. Uh, polarization, the way the press is being treated, uh, I think those fears are now even more uh, clear, I suppose, because of the digital era. Uh, Trump in with information and, and trying to manipulate information, and I suppose, is much easier these days than it used to be before. So uh, uh, the fact that, that, that we have this forum here for 
student invention. And I think it's great because uh, I, I think I read uh, in the uh, magazine, The Economist, that this election is going to be dominated by the younger generations. And so the younger generations are much more subject to social media than the older generations. And I think that's uh, 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 something to worry about. And I suppose that the antidote to that is having a public discussion like the one we're having now, uh, and, and try to look for ways of uh, really finding the truth, not just believing what you read in the articles that just pop up in your Facebook website or, or what other friends are seeing. Uh, I think that one healthy practice is to even read things that people that you don't agree with are writing. So you can keep alive that critical attitude of checking the facts for yourself. Thank you. Uh, so we are almost at 12.30 and I want to be sure to leave uh, room for questions. I know the audience is not huge, but uh, uh, you know, if you ask a good question, we could uh, do a lot with it. So um, is there any, anyone on the, in the audience who would like to just come to the front and ask a question to all of us or to just one of the panelists. We, we do have a question from one of our virtual attendees. Um, so uh, he said, I have heard a lot of good points highlighting the issues of polarization, foreign involvement by the US, strength of global institutions, and the Middle East. My question is, are these all directly correlated to the Trump administration? It would appear to me instead that the United States has been making mistakes by both parties for 20 years, and only now are we confronted. More than 20, I would say, by both parties. No, you know, just responding just as myself, uh, I would actually kind of bring up uh, a concept that uh, H.R. McMaster, who used to be National Security Advisor under Trump, uh, and basically, you know, just couldn't go on doing his job and resign. Uh, a book that he just published called Battleground. Now, the concept that he is uh, promoting there is something called strategic empathy. Uh, he's basically arguing that the U.S. has lacked strategic empathy for much of its history as a world power, and then has basically got it, got it into all kinds of mistakes um, and uh, dead ends. Uh, because what the U.S. has practiced instead is what he calls strategic narcissism. This belief that we are the best uh, everybody else just needs to watch us and, and uh, follow us what we're doing. Uh, we don't need to understand or empathize with our partners or our enemies or opponents. Uh, now, this has gotten the U.S. into all kinds of trouble, as I said, and uh, even today makes the U.S. much less effective at being a world power than it could be. Now, uh, strategic empathy doesn't mean um, kind of... Uh, not having principles or values or ideals. You don't have to empathize with everybody equally. But uh, one of the biggest problems in the US is that the, whether it's the older generations or the younger generations, you are so consumed by what happens in this country, you are so fixated by what happens in this country and so ignorant of what happens outside that I don't think you have any business being a world power unless you inform yourselves and educate yourselves about what's going on elsewhere. And you know, Trust me, the Russians and the Chinese are being much more well informed because they know they have a lot of catching up to do. Yet the US continues to basically indulge in this ignorance and narcissism, right? Thinking that, you know, we don't need to care what happens in the rest of the world because we are the best and the greatest. Um, it's not gonna go well. Well, I think uh, I, I like the question. I think this is a very good point there. Um, uh, for example, if I have to think about what happened in Venezuela with Chavez, uh, one cannot believe that just uh, Chavez can pop up and uh, bad luck, right? It, it, it tends to be the result of other things that kind of led us there. So probably one could apply the same line of reasoning uh, for any other country like the US. Uh, 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 part of what I would like to emphasize, though, is that this concern about the erosion of democracy and the need to strengthen democracy doesn't have anything to do with ideological ideas 
or, or, or defending any political party. This is independent of that. Democracy is something that we should strengthen no matter what we believe in because it's the best system that we know of that would allow us to protect our freedoms and, and rights. Well, I mean, if, if I could kind of just push us a little further on that. Uh, it seems to me that uh, a number of regimes in the world now are seeing what the U.S. is going through and uh, pronouncing that democracy's days are over or numbered, that uh, the failure of the American democratic, democratic system uh, or its, its current struggles is a sign that authoritarian systems are more effective uh, and just better. And that you know, there is no need for democracy to be a model for the rest of the world. And maybe I just want to say, pay close attention to this erosion. It's like what in-law calls the step-by-step, but the, the carpet is not pulled all at once. You see, right. it's bit by bit, right. and you really need to trace those processes. What's happening now in Ohio, for example, with the, where do you put the, uh, can you send the ballot? Where do you put the, the boxes? I mean, these are big things, and these are as global as local, because it sends messages to the rest of the world, this is acceptable, do it. Because the U.S., whether we want it or not, I mean, you can think of it as the decline of the empire, what's happening now, and it's like the empire at its best in terms of showing all its weaknesses, and Trump just puts it on, on the table. Uh, but there are, we are connected. Our world is connected, and it worries me to death when I hear about these um, uh, nationalist movements that are increasing within the U.S. and outside. I mean, this is gonna be, maybe if it's not gonna come to my neighborhood, it's in the process, the question is when, and we really have to be aware. And when I think about now with the Supreme Court, what are people's, what are they basing their vote on? It really worries me because I see it as just either this or that, and not really comprehensive to understand the complexity. And not that Biden is gonna bring the solution. When it comes to the Middle East, I stated from the beginning, it doesn't make much of a difference because the U.S. is the backdrop of Israel, period. I mean, Israel, a country of 8 million people, gets a third of military aid of what the U.S. gives to the whole world. There's a problem with those calculations. Turkey, Egypt, these are not countries I want to support, right? And I'm from the Middle East. So it's interesting to think of um, how this translates on the ground, what messages this is sending and what effect this is having. And we really need to be accountable, because one thing that really troubles me when I think about Iraq is that you go in, you destroy a country, you displace people, no one is held accountable for anything. I mean, only Abu Ghraib, what, three people with like low rank got held accountable, period. That was it. Rumsfeld, Cheney, they all made careers, President Bush re-elected. I mean, these are questions for people, if they're paid. When I've been working with refugees, you see people got destroyed over and over and over again. If we speak of Palestinians, I mean, the ones who sought refuge in Syria in 48 are now displaced in Germany. So this is like in a lifetime, you're displaced three times. This is unheard of. I mean, it's really. And to have to start your life over and over and over again because we want to sell more weapons, we want to boast of our you know, military power. I don't know. These are troubling, and the connections are really deep. And I think why people pay attention, why my mom watches the news from the Middle East more than I do here, because it concerns them. It's what happens here affects them, whether they want it or not. And this is, these are the kind of connections we really need to be aware of and act on, not just be aware of. Is there any comment from this side of the... Uh, well, I just, just the, the, the question is great. And I think uh, there's, there's, there's always this two, I think it depends on what you're looking at, you know, whether you're talking, is this a longer trend thing or is this a, uh, you know, current administration thing uh, that we're, we're talking about. Uh, and so it depends on what subsets of issues or what uh, configuration of issues you're looking at. But it is true that, I mean, I was just reading yesterday a book by a French scholar called Bruno Latour, and he really thinks about this, you know, this, he calls this thing Trumpism, you know, this Trumpist ideology or Trumpist uh, politics. And he takes that stand against those who feel that this is just, and, and he sees this particular administration as not just a figure, eh, but not just a person, but the administration as a symptom of a phenomenon, so not necessarily in and, in and of itself, uh, that which, but, but there are people who take a different position based on different kinds of issues that they're looking at. Add just one sentence before Dr. K 
based on it's not a strong person. It's the values he represents and the people who support him that I think need to be held accountable. Because in the end, he's one person. But it's the fact that he was elected, might be re-elected, what he promotes, what passes from under our table, you know, on a daily basis. These are the things that worry me. I'm not the, the, the man himself, you know, you can, I don't know, have your own ideas about whether you like him or not. But the fact that he's in power and he continues to erode so much. Okay, I, I just add one thing, maybe two things. <laughs> so, uh, after the Soviet Union collapsed, the, the neoconservatives in the United States, they create a plan to basically conquer the entire world under the banner of the United States. And then, then in early 2000, it seemed very successful because Rumsfeld and Dick Cheney, like all the manufacturers of war in Iraq and Afghanistan, they were near conservatives and then they tried to epitomize the American exceptionalism and American hegemony beyond this so-called Western free market democracy for the Democratic bloc. Um, I'm saying like even though the American exceptionalism and American hegemony has existed for a long time, but then the president create has a, like the administration and president. Okay, let me just put that away. The real changes has been always possible through people, not just the one president. Like a group of people or a huge group of people, a crowd come together and then they push political agenda and then they have they they create the changes. So that's why I rely on a lot of the younger generation, like Dylan Jeff Denison, because this younger this generation seems this generation is different from previous generation. So that let's make the show like they are it is people who make changes, not the president only. However, the U.S. president has some kind of a symbolic power. Whether the person kind of like sets the tone for global justice or social justice. So that's why I, I think that it's very important. This election is very important because now we have, a, have the opportunity to change that kind of tone in American politics and global politics or we may just give the message that the United States will continue to take the path of American exceptionalism and that this is narcissistic people. What do you say, like narcissistic empathy or strategic narcissism? Yeah, sometimes not even very strategic. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, the, the whole idea of American exceptionalism is worth thinking more about. You know, just what, if anything, is exceptional about the US. I think really um, the current administration doesn't understand what the world admires about America. Instead, it has its own basically imagined idea, of the idea that the world admires America only for raw brute strength, for hard power instead of soft power. Now, American soft power doesn't consist of Hollywood, MBA, and all that only. Right? American soft power actually consists of certain ideals that really inspire and invigorate liberals in countries that do not have a liberal system to fight for more social justice, more freedom, more rights. If the U.S. doesn't even value those rights and freedoms and social justice in its own country, what kind of an example is it setting the rest of the world? What kind of soft power can it have remaining? And if you lose that soft power and all you have is hard power, I'm sorry, basically you're finished because hard power is very easy to replicate. Other questions? Any possibility of, of what? Could you just repeat the last
So basically, can we fix things, and if so, how? Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I, I think it's a, it's a wonderful question, and I'm also a little sad, you know, to, to hear it, like as if uh, this, you know, that the perspective would be that not, you know, that the harm done cannot be fixed. Um, when hearing, uh, um, you know, administrators and professionals working, for example, at the World Health Organization in the news, this question was asked of them, and what they said is, it will take time, but it, of course, it, it's essential that the connection is reestablished uh, in that institution as in the others. Um, and, and as long as there's a willingness to reconnect, and of course you have below the decision makers in the administration, you have the professionals that are still, you know, in uh, various research institutions associated with NIH and so on, uh, that are of course, you know, at various levels still collaborating. So the resources for reestablishing dialogue, uh, collaboration and diplo diplomatic uh, connections is of, are of course there. It will just take time to reestablish where the sense of trust has somewhat eroded. It, what um, Dr. Stewart just said, uh, well, the United States alone cannot rectify the damages they have created. They also, like, in order to rectify this damage, they need a global partnership. And then the U.S. alone has not created all world problems. They were followers of the United U, the U.S. footsteps, who are like the whole countries um, in in the global community have created a lot of damage collectively. So the my question is how like as a global community, all human beings can work together to whatever damage we have caused. And then I think the first step should begin where you stand right now. And as um, Dr. Nusser said before, domestic issues in the United States are always connected to global issues. So what you solve here, where you are, has global impact. So never ever underestimate your power, what you are doing here, because it has global impact even though you don't see it. So let's say that if the United States solved the problem of gun violence, I'm pretty sure like a lot of war and armed conflict caused by United States or um, United States are involved in will be solved, part of it. And then if the United States can solve like um, economic inequality and poverty in this country, and they may, they, they may um, contribute to reducing global poverty. So I just encourage um, all students and anyone if you want to rectify the damage uh, we have created collectively, and we can rectify it one by one from where we stand right now. So let me just uh, quickly say something. You know, one thing that's become very clear in the last 10 to 20 years is that economic globalization has harmed many people around the world, even as it has benefited others. And that harm and that benefit is not distributed equitably or evenly across the globe. It has harmed more people in certain parts of the world, right? and uh, some classes and regions more than others. Now, one of the reasons why we are in this state now in the U.S. is because globalization has been good for some subset of this population here in the U.S., but it has harmed many other Americans as well. Uh, and, you know, it's very easy, not just here in the U.S., but in other parts of the world that, are, you know, are feeling the, some of the negative effects of globalization to fall back on nationalism, isolationism, you know, hate, xenophobia, and so on, as a solution to that. But it's really no solution at all. The only way to solve the problems caused by globalization is for the globe to work together to make the benefits of globalization more evenly and equitably felt. Right? But for that to happen, you need to have some leadership. You need to have a country, a world power that says, this is something that needs to be done. And we're going to we work really hard to do it. America has basically kind of given up its, its leadership role in that by falling back on nationalism and saying that, you know, America first, that's all we care about. It's really not America first, as many others have pointed out. It's America alone right now. America has basically turned its back on its friends in the world and has basically declared it's going to be selfish from now on. And, you know, what kind of an image does that really send? What kind of a message does it send to other people around the world who are suffering from globalization 
and who would like the U.S. to play some kind of leading role in redressing that. I'm going to be brief, just on two quick points. <clears throat> One, talking to people overseas, they differentiate between the government and the people, and that's usually the first thing they say about the separation between the two, which I think is really important. Uh, and like I said, I've been away, uh, so watching people's response to the Black Lives Matter movement, people out in the street in the U.S. demonstrating. Um, so questions of solidarity, questions of accountability are crucially important. If we're looking at solidarity, when we talk about Ferguson and Palestine, when we talk about um, Syrian refugees demonstrating in solidarity with what's happening in the U.S., for me that gives hope. But I really think that the kind of accountable systems we create here are, are important because they increase that solidarity and they make the ties, they bring the issues together in ways that otherwise are impossible because if we're silent, if we're listening that Drags kind of go from underneath our feet, it's going to be really harder. One, to hold um, 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 uh, abusers of, uh, of, of rights and of, uh, of our uh, well being accountable, but also to bring those bridges of solidarity. And I'm looking at how people are connecting, especially for the younger generation. I mean, people are doing amazing things in terms of connections. Um, uh, online and the kind of solidarities that cross all kinds of borders. So this is limited in terms of the possibilities that this offers, but it really needs to have that accountability built into it. Otherwise, it's, it's not going to transform or reach the transformation that we have tried. Uh, and that is, I think that I agree with what all my colleagues have said. I think that uh, by getting more and more involved, participating in global discussion, becoming more and more a global citizen rather than a citizen of a single country, are healthy practices. And, and I just wanted to say that just looking at what students here at Denison are doing with organizing, for example, these kind of events, give me hope. Second that. We have 10 more minutes, so are there other questions from the floor or from online? We do have one more. Um, and you guys have kind of touched on this throughout the discussion, but um, you know, in the US, uh, you know, a lot of data and research has shown that everyone is getting more polarized. Um, and you know, we've talked about that and you know, how trust between parties and trust between individuals in general and institutions is eroding. Um, the U.S. and you know, like clearly that shifts a little bit away from possibly just a purely political issue and into a lot of other social issues and um, just how people relate to each other. Um, but I guess like maybe each of you could give like a point um, on how we create more empathy and dialogue to like save what's degrading and to like lead to the if I could start first, and uh, you know, it's, it's a little ironic I'm saying this to someone who's on Zoom uh, at a time when COVID basically forces us to do everything remote. But really, the biggest thing that I feel is needed is for us to get off social media. I don't use social media, so I'm not talking about myself. And I, I deliberately do not use social media, not just because it sucks up so much time, but because social media really becomes an excuse not to engage with real people who may have different. Uh, points of view than ourselves. Social media becomes a bubble, right? We, we think it connects us to many people, but it, it actually brings out the worst in us uh, in many cases, self-righteousness, anger, hate, anxiety, fear, right? Uh, not some of the best emotions that we need in order to actually unite and connect and work together. So I think on, on balance, right, in some, social media actually has been a more harmful force in our society and societies around the world that it has benefited us. I know it's difficult to stop, but uh, you know, just get off Twitter for just one day and go out and talk to real people and try to understand how they see the world. You know, you're not going to get that on Twitter, unfortunately. I wish you could, but it doesn't happen because of the way that these platforms are designed. I actually, in part, disagree. I think Twitter could be a start for people to get interested and to really build curiosities and to um, uh, find connections with people. Uh, I feel like doing both, the online and on the ground, read, learn about places, 
be uncomfortable with things. Um, sometimes I feel we want everything to be orderly and kind of within certain confines. And um, that might limit travel, be open, read newspapers from other places, with other languages. Um, but read, read, read. I mean, we're educators. It's all about learning. And the more you open these horizons, the different you know, possibilities that will bring. And I think for uh, a school like ours, for a younger generation, I think the organizing is crucial. The learning, these presentations, I remember uh, in 2003, before the U.S. invasion, I was at Hampshire College, and they would have these 24 hours. I mean, it would be people coming to talk, and it would be interesting to see what would happen at that time between now and November, uh, and after, because there's going to be an after. I, I, I guess I would just say that in order to have more time to read, you have to stop reading so many tweets. You know, it's, the time has to come from somewhere, right? And I mean, the reason I'm not I'm not totally down with social media, but at the same time, I, I see way too many students spending the time uh, reading tweets from people somewhere else instead of engaging with people right on this campus, whom they could get to understand and befriend, um, and widen their perspective that way, right? Um, and that's what I really wish I would see more. You know. I wish I would see more people talking to each other rather than sitting beside each other and, you know, reading somebody else who, you know, may not be all that different from them because that, that's the way the self-selection happens. I think this is maybe the biggest question. I myself really, and, I, and it's still, it's, I mean, I myself and the, my, my, the people I talk to and I see scholars and specialists coming up with different, somewhat different readings of this conundrum of extreme pol polarization, which is here the question, right? This taking up of these, you know, totally opposed positions and the, and the, and the way in which uh, people can be so, so, so fix, fixated, right? So, so, so uh, fixated in those oppositions. So, so I guess, yes, of course, um, community of concern, talk to, be with people around you that you have, uh, you know, that you live around, that you engage with in your everyday life, and talk about your concerns. What is, what are the matters of concern that connect you in your everyday life? Rather than saying, what are the facts necessarily that we're going to debate about, let's say, global warming or something like that. What is the concern? What has to sustain a good life for me? in this place and in this community. And I would imagine that starting there or, or staying there might, uh, you know, might invite third positions. So positions that are in between opposites that are already carved out by political, you know, in political discourse. Now I'm speaking as a religion scholar. Um, yeah, first I advise you to create a community, even if it's virtual. And second is liberate yourself from binary thinking. Liberate yourself from the dichotomy between us and them. And then always check whether you uh, check uh, critically reflect on self-righteousness. Even liberals and progressives can be self-righteous and then they don't necessarily see uh, the masculinized culture or patriarchal culture, or something is wrong within their political movement. And continue to cross the boundaries. Like crossing boundaries is difficult and scary, but also a lot of like feminist scholars and activists articulate the joy of crossing boundaries, dwelling in between in between place. And then a lot of Asian feminists talked about interstitial integrity. Our identity itself actually crosses multiple boundaries. So my immediate advice is like try to liberate yourself from the binary thinking system and then the dichotomy between us and them. I totally agree with what you just said. And I think that maybe the only thing that I can add, add up to that is that usually liberating ourselves from binary thinking it's it's difficult because it requires courage to let go of some of the ideas that maybe we have held before and and in a way it's like uh, learning how to die not physically but in the plane of ideas and and, and i just want to say that that is not a difficult that is a difficult thing to do 
and it just requires uh, not just intellect but courage. So I will just add that to this. Okay, so thank you very much for listening, whether you're here or somewhere else on campus or in the world. Um, so I hope that this has been helpful and informative to you. Uh, if you have any other questions, uh, you know, you can send them to the organizers and maybe they'll send them, send them our way and we'll see what we can do with them. Uh, I believe, yeah, thank you very much to the and Jacob for organizing this. I believe this is also going to be put up as a recording on, on the Doobie. So, um, you know, if you missed it live, you can still watch it uh, or listen to it. Do you want to announce the next event that you're Yes, organizing? please do. Yeah. Uh, we're doing the next definitely planned event. October 8th is going to be Black Lives Matter Social Movement. And we're going to have students, faculty, and staff speak with us. Maybe same location, it might be in the next. And there will be posters going up. Great. Lots Great. of them. Wonderful. Yeah, it's the same time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.